Welcome to our focus symposium on pediatric pelvic health. We are delighted that you are taking an interest in this topic as it is a very important and dear topic to all of those of us on this panel. Today you will be hearing from myself, Karina Syracusa. I'm from the Midwest in the United States. And I will be talking about motor control in the pediatric pelvic floor. Our second speaker unfortunately could not be here with us due to a medical emergency, but Els Baker from Belgium has videotaped her presentation on normal urinary development and you will be seeing that today. After that, you will be hearing from Wendy Bauer from Australia on lower urinary tract dysfunction. And then final, finally, we have Dawn sandal Sidi from the Western portion of the United States who will be speaking on bowel dysfunction in the pediatric patient. After our initial presentation, we will have time for questions from our panel. We hope that this presentation gives you a basic knowledge and a basic understanding of the issues that can face children with bowel and bladder dysfunction and a working knowledge of how to help them. Although we, this course can't be completely comprehensive on the treatment of children with bowel and bladder dysfunction, at the end we will also give you some references and some further coursework that you could take if this is a subject that interests you. Before we get started, we wanted to get a little bit of a sense of the room. Uh, how many people in this room are already treating pediatric bowel and bladder dysfunction? Great. And how many are pelvic floor physiotherapists? Wonderful. And how many are just mainly pediatric physiotherapists? Great. We have a great mix in the room and we really appreciate that. So we're going to try to tailor our presentation a little bit. Um, in order to really make sure that uh, everybody gets something out of this. So I'm going to start by talking about motor control of the pediatric pelvic floor. So just as an introduction, the process of storage and emptying of the bladder requires coordination of the smooth and striated muscles of the true pelvis, and this includes the pelvic floor muscles. Whether the pelvic floor muscles are the primary driver in bowel and bladder dysfunction, or the visceral dysfunction that leads to a delay in motor control is not often clear in the pediatric population. So just for those of you who don't treat pelvic floor, I always like to put this slide up. There are a lot of muscles in the pelvic floor, which unfortunately means a lot of things can go wrong in the process of both micturition and defecation. There is growing research into the subject of pelvic floor treatment for the pediatric patient. Pelvic floor issues can arise in both the neurologically involved child and the typically developing child. So this is not just something that pediatric physios might see or pelvic floor physios might see. There is a, a, a treatment for both. Care must be taken to examine the motor function principles of the child to determine the correct pelvic floor treatment options. And that's a little bit what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. There is not much research into the development of the pelvic floor muscle control of the child. We have a lot of research into embryology and when the bladder develops, when the bowel develops, but when that connection between pelvic floor musculature and uh, the bowel and bladder function, there's not much research, so there's not many milestones that we can really point to exactly as to when this control should have developed. In the infant, the neural pathways that control micturition in children are present at birth. Uninhibited bladder contractions do not often happen in the infant. So the bladder is contracting when it is full in children. Now those of you who maybe have changed a lot of diapers would disagree with that. Um, but you, the children are only voiding when their bladder is actually reaching capacity. Bladder control is also controlled cognitively. The coordination of the bladder and urinary sphincters usually occurs around two years of age, and that is when generally we potty train. Although this is different depending on where you live, your culture, your religion sometimes. So we know that this happens around two years of age, but depending on the region and where you live, you may gain continence a little earlier or later based on your practices. In order to obtain bladder control, children must sense bladder fullness. They need to be able to know when it is time to go. If they cannot sense that due to, say, sensory processing dysfunction, then they may not be able to sense when they need to go, which could lead to some bladder issues. 
Children must also sense the pelvic floor muscle function. They must be able to feel what those pelvic floor muscles are doing in order to contract and relax the pelvic floor to store and empty urine from the bladder. So if they don't have correct sensation to the pelvic floor muscles, say in a child that has spina bifida, they may not be able to sense what those pelvic floor muscles are doing and will have problems with continence. Children must have intact neural control for complete bowel continence. We also know, and if any of you have seen the squatty potty, which we're going to talk about later, we also know that toilet positioning and upright posture is very important for the ability to release stool. Coordination of contraction and relaxation of the puborectalis muscle, which I'm gonna show you here on the next slide, and intact internal anal sphincter for sampling reflex is paramount. Now the internal anal sphincter and that sampling reflex, what that means is when something enters the rectal canal, the internal anal sphincter relaxes just briefly in order to sample and decide what is in the rectal canal. Is it solid, liquid, or gas? It then sends that signal up to the brain and the brain decides, should we release this now and blame it on the dog? Or should we wait until there's maybe something that's a little bit a more convenient time to release this? So both of those mechanisms need to be intact in order we, uh, for us to have intact bowel control. So this is a picture of that puborectalis muscle. It is my favorite pelvic floor muscle. Uh, we can see at sitting, uh, normal sitting and at rest, that muscle is contracted. It's maintaining a low level of contraction in order to maintain what we call the anal rectal angle. And I don't have a pointer here, but uh, you can see that this angle here is what's controlling some of the bowel continence. When we are in a squatted position, that puborectalis muscle is able to easily relax and obliterate that anal rectal angle, allowing that rectum to become vertical, and it allows us to release the contents of the rectum easily. When we're children and infants, we instinctively do this. You will often see children, um, as my sister used to do, hide behind a couch and squat down in order to have a bowel movement into her diaper. Uh, we do this instinctively because we know that when we squat, it helps us to relax that muscle. It's only as we become adults that we lose those good squatting habits and we tend to uh, gain some, some bad posture habits on the toilet. But when we're thinking from a motor control perspective, this child needs to be able to squat in order to gain that full relaxation of the puborectalis muscle. If we're having issues with motor development and we don't gain some of these gross motor functions, then we may not gain the correct ability to relax and release stool. This little guy is a patient of mine and he has a lot of low muscle tone. So he did not gain a lot of his gross motor milestones. You can kind of see at eight months, he's still not really able to sit up properly. Uh, he has some low belly tone. He's really, his arms are very lax at his sides. And so he had a lot of problems with constipation because he couldn't relax that pelvic floor. He couldn't get into a good squatted position, uh, even as a young child. And so he had a lot of issues with retention of stool. Conversely, this is another little gal of mine. If you have a patient that is in a wheelchair and is maybe not gaining the strength of the abdominal muscles and the pelvic floor muscles, or they're, because they're in this wheelchair and they're using a diaper and they're never getting onto a toilet to go to the bathroom, they're not really getting in that squatted position. When we tend to seat children in wheelchairs uh, that have a neurological deficit, we tend to seat them at more of a 90 degree angle for their hips. And so they're never really getting that good squatted position, which can lead to issues with fecal retention. Let's look a little bit at the muscle development in children. At birth, our diaphragm is still in an oblique position and our pelvic floor does not yet have a postural function. If you think about infants, they're in either a supine or a prone position all of the time. So their pelvic floor, while it is contracting and relaxing, is not playing as much of a role in postural function at this point. There's also no postural relationship between the abdominal muscles and the low back muscles in the small infant, because again, they're in a supine or a prone position the majority of the time. As children develop their spinal curves with growth and development, then the diaphragm widens and the pelvic floor begins to develop a more muscular function.
So again, when we're looking at an infant, they have not yet developed those cervical or those lumbar curves. The relationship of their thorax and their diaphragm and their pelvic floor is completely different than it is in an adult at this point because they don't have those correct spinal curvatures. If children do not go through the normal developmental sequence, then it can possibly affect the development of the pelvic floor and their ability to contract and relax those muscles. So for instance, children with slow transit constipation can tend to have decreased abdominal muscle contraction ability. Now whether that con uh, decreased contraction ability has resulted from a neurologic deficit or just poor stability, both of those can lead to issues with slow transit constipation. We need that muscular function and we need that normal pelvic control, pelvic thoracic control in order to be able to have full continence. The pelvic floor also plays a major role in anticipatory postural reactions and postural synergies. So in both in neurologically compromised and typically developing children, postural synergies can be compromised if there's a gross motor developmental delay. So in the case of Ava here, who's a patient of mine, and sorry any of you who don't like clowns, I almost cut the clown out of this picture, um, but you can see from this picture of Ava, so she has a pelvic obliquity, she's sitting on one side of her pelvis due to some scoliosis, uh, she has a spinal cord injury that was sustained at birth, so she also has poor abdominal tone and poor postural control, she's in a wheelchair all the time. And she had a lot of problems with bladder and bowel, not because she couldn't sense when she needed to go, but because she couldn't adequately contract and relax those muscles. So her postural asymmetries and her lack of that anticipatory postural control led to a lot of bowel and bladder dysfunction. And I think especially as pediatric therapists, I, I started off as, as a pediatric therapist before I got into bowel and bladder, I think we don't often look at this. We assume that a bowel and bladder issue is kind of an inevitable part of the neurologic dysfunction, but that is not always true. There's a lot of things that we can do here with both wheelchair seating and postural control that can lead to improved continence for these children. As children mature, they have significant changes in their postural control, which then can affect their ability to control their pelvic floor. Geometry also affects the diaphragm and the ribcage diaphragm, which can affect postural control. So in this case, we think of many of our children that have severe scoliosis. Their diaphragm and their pelvic floor are going to be in an, an inopportune position in order to be able to effectively contract and relax because of that asymmetry of their thoracic cage. So they possibly could develop continence later or they could develop constipation because they don't have the correct positioning for their diaphragm and their pelvic floor muscles. Also in neurologically involved children, the uh, decrease in posture and the decrease in anticipatory control can cause slower maturation of the pelvic floor, therefore slowing rates of continence and slowing the ability for them to toilet train. Children with neurologic deficits often toilet train much later, even if they have intact neural control to the bladder. The other thing, in typically developing children, there's a clear transition of postural control between the ages of 9 and 11 in both boys and girls. Postural control comes to full maturity between the ages of 13 and 14. In both of these age ranges, that's when we often see increased rates of urinary incontinence in the typically developing child. So for the first set, the children that are between 9 and 11 and are having that transition of postural control, it may just be that they're losing postural control, they're losing the ability to contract and relax those pelvic floor muscles, which may lead to an increase in weakness. And then also, between the ages of 13 and 14, this is often when we see an increase in sporting activities with a lot of these children. When they're going from middle school to high school and they're increasing their sporting time, if they don't have good core stability, then this is often when we see urinary incontinence issues. In a child that maybe never had urinary incontinence issues before, because they are now increasing the sporting activity without the basic core stability, they're going to leak. And at this age, this is when these children are even less likely to actually report urinary incontinence. 
So they may leak, but they're not going to tell anybody about it because they're embarrassed about it. And this is a great time for us as physiotherapists to intervene. There's also age-related differences that must be considered when evaluating children for pelvic floor muscle function. Uh, looking at where are they on the developmental scale, should they have the fine motor skills to be able to unbutton a button? And if they don't, should you be putting them in button pants when they're toilet training? This is going to lead to failure for them when they're toilet training if they can't undo the buttons fast enough. Cognitive ability and motor function are imperative when discussing the treatment of pediatric pelvic floor. If you have a cognitively impaired child, you may not be able to get as far as you want with continence, but in talking to the parents, you may be able to work with them on some behavioral techniques that will help improve their success rate with continence. You also want to look at the uh, dynamic systems theory. So maturation of systems will affect performance. We need organization proper maturation of systems, internal drive. If you do not have a child that's motivated to toilet train, there is no amount of reward, stickers, food, anything like that that is going to push them to toilet train. But they also need that postural control and proper sensory functioning that plays the uh, part in the child's ability to gain continence. So when we're looking at evaluation just very quickly, typically in adults, we uh, will often assess the pelvic floor muscles with an internal exam. And this is not what we do in the pediatric population. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, under the age of 16, we really should not be doing as much internal exam um, with these children. So we often assess their muscle function externally, either through visual inspection of the perineum we might do an anal wink to see if they have intact sensation, or surface EMG is also another really good tactic in, in order to be able to assess the pelvic floor muscle function in these children. Patients must have normalized gross motor milestones in order to be able to achieve continence on time. And so when I'm look, talking to pediatric therapists, they understand where these gross motor milestones are supposed to hit. But if you're a pelvic floor physio that's maybe not as familiar with treating children, you really need to know the gross motor milestone tables. When should children be crawling? When should they be sitting up? When should they be walking? Because if they haven't hit those gross motor milestones on time, it could possibly affect their ability to contract and relax those pelvic floor muscles. So when I do my intake as a pelvic floor physio for a child, I have uh, questions about when they hit those gross motor milestones. Did they walk early? Did they not crawl at all? So did they skip crawling or creeping and go straight to walking? Because that's gonna tell me a little bit about how those pelvic floor muscles and how that diaphragm developed. The other important thing to think about is that postural exercise should be an important component of treatment. And we know this for not just for children, but also for adults. Uh, there was a study in 2014 talking about Swiss ball exercises. Uh, so doing just basic Swiss ball exercises and postural control can really help with continence. And then talking to patients about toilet positioning, making sure that children have good posture and good toilet position in order to fully achieve continence. So for this little gal who's using a gait trainer because she has not developed the ability to walk, she's not gonna have the same anticipatory control and the same pelvic floor control that a child that maybe walks on time. So important gross motor milestones when you're looking at pelvic floor control. You wanna look at quadruped. Quadruped helps us to develop the spinal curvatures. It helps to develop the proper rib cage diameter and diaphragmatic function. And then it also helps us to develop the scapular stabilizer complex. And without those, you're not going to be able to achieve proper continence. And then static standing is the other one that I'm really concerned about. Because static standing is what helps us to anticipate some of that, that anticipatory uh, postural control. So it helps to develop the postural control muscles. It develops the proper diaphragm orientation because if you can't take a big deep breath and you can't contract that diaphragm, you're not gonna be able to bear down as effectively for good bowel function. 
And then static standing also is what helps us to develop our pelvic floor muscles. This is where our pelvic floor muscles really learn how to contract and how to contract that low level of contraction during standing so that we remain continent. If we're looking briefly at the neurologically involved child, children with cerebral palsy tend to have increased muscle spasticity and increased tendency for scoliosis, which then leads to poor postural control and can lead to bowel and bladder difficulty. Children with Down syndrome have poor anticipatory postural reactions. They tend to be more low muscle tone, which then suggests poor postural control and poor pelvic floor muscle strength. Children with Down syndrome will often toilet train much later than their typically developing peers. But there are things that we can do to help that as pelvic floor physios and as pediatric physios to push this along. And finally, children on the autism spectrum have poor sensory motor functioning. They often cannot feel if their bladder is full, so they will wait too long and then have bladder accidents because they cannot feel when that bladder is full. They also have decreased postural control. They often are more on the lower tone side of things, and so they will have a lot of times slow transit constipation because they can't adequately contract their abdominal muscles in order to bear down effectively. So there are things that we as physiotherapists can intervene. We may not get these children continent, and I'm always very realistic with my families as far as how far I think I can get these children, but we can make a huge difference in their toilet training and their continence, which really is gonna help out not only in their home life, but also their school life. So we wanna make sure that we're considering where the child is in motor control development when assessing bowel and bladder function. What age are they at? How uh, far have they gotten in their gross motor milestones? And this is gonna give us a really good idea of where we should start with our pelvic floor muscle training. Assessment of postural functioning may be a way to assess pelvic floor function without invasive techniques. Looking at some basic static standing and balance tests that we do, uh, I take uh, measurements from the Peabody all the time and that I can translate into what I think their pelvic floor is going to be able to do. And adding postural control exercises should be an integral part of any pelvic floor therapy treatment plan when you're talking to children. So you never should be just doing Kegel exercises and just looking at the pelvic floor. You really have to look at the whole body and make sure that those things are developing on time. I'm gonna pause this for just a second. So next, um, we are gonna have Els Baker's video. Um, where she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, normal urinary development. And then after that, we will go on to the next presentation. And we'll have time for questions for all of us at the end. I first want to say how sorry I feel that I'm not able to attend the meeting in Cape Town this year. I hope to see you all in Geneva next year. But I'm happy that I'm still able to join you to give my little talk about lower urinary tract dysfunction in children. If ever you have questions about the presentation, you can always email me, or I hope to be able to join you through a Skype connection later on the day. I declare having no conflict of interest with anyone. What are we going to talk about during those 20 minutes? First, I will try to explain what are we, our lower urinary tract dysfunction. What are the signs and the frequency of those problems in a healthy population? How can you identify them? What is standard urotherapy? And how and when to use alarm? We all know that communication and coordination between brain and bladder is very complicated. It has been nicely described by Holstegen in 2010 but it is far too uh, complicated to explain during this workshop. So I split it up, the working of the bladder in two phases. One filling phase, which should occur at low bladder pressure, and one emptying phase, where you don't need to have any obstacle. During the filling phase, we should not have any detrusor contraction 
we should not assist an excessive healing and we need a good compliance of the bladder. During the emptying phase, in contrary, we need a contraction of the bladder muscle, we need an opening of the bladder neck, and in order to maintain the poison, a relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles. In order to achieve confidence, the child has to go through different steps. First of all, he needs to get a correct information from the bladder to the brain and afterwards get a correct response from the brain back to the bladder. He needs to be able to voluntarily postpone the voiding, to initiate the voiding when it is at a socially accepted time and to maintain the urine flow until complete bladder emptying. First step, correct information. Information of what's going on in the bladder is gathered in the nucleus of GERD, which is situated at S2, S4 level. It's then transported by R delta fibers, who are situated in the smooth muscles and will give information on the tension of the bladder wall. C fibers will only be activated if there is infection or excessive filling of the bladder and will be perceived as pain. This information will be sent to the periapter ductal gray, which is the part of our brain who is coping with all the visceral information. Once the brain gets the information, it has to give a correct response to the bladder. This response should be during the filling phase no contraction at all of the detrusor in order to fill the bladder at low pressure. If we look into the images of Griffith, we see that in a normal person there is an equivalent cortical response for a small or big bladder cell. In patients suffering from overactive bladder, we see a very diminished response when there is a small bladder volume and an exaggerated response for a big volume. There is a lack of central inhibition of the bladder and this lack of central inhibition, which should normally be performed by the prefrontal cortex, this lack will be taken over by the cortex cingula anterior and the right insula, which are part of the limbic The third part the child should be able to do during the filling phase is voluntarily postpone the voiding. <clears throat> this postponement will be done through a contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. This contraction will trigger the sacral reflex in a very short way and will inhibit the detrusor and will also trigger the pontine nutrition center to reinforce the inhibition of the detrusor and reinforce the contraction of the pelvic floor muscle. This is exactly the way that the PP stop is working. This means that he is going to understand that in closing the doors he will be able to postpone the voiding. A lot of children will use this postponement of the voiding in an excessive way when they start going to school, where toilets are not as nice as at home. Very often doors are not closing, other people coming in. And until now, it is not very clear if the strong pelvic floor and the inability to relax those muscles will lead to an overactive bladder, or if it's the other way around, a lack of central inhibition on the bladder will lead to a very strong pelvic floor. Probably both are possible. The next step we are going into the emptying phase. The emptying phase is to initiate the voiding. And to initiate the voiding, we need to stop the central inhibition. The periacroductal gray will then allow the medial part of the pontine nutrition center to open the bladder neck and to have a detrusor contraction in order to empty the bladder. 
maintain the voiding and the complete emptying, we need a relaxation of pelvic floor muscle. Because if there is a contraction of pelvic floor muscle, if this is a voluntary or automatic contraction, it will be the same. We will have the sacral reflex entering in the game and an interruption of the voiding leading to incomplete emptying of the bladder, which can lead and will lead very often to recurrent urinary tract infection. So if we put the pathologies in the same way as we did the physiology into a filling and emptying phase, during the filling phase, we will see overactive bladder, which is the uninhibited contraction of the bladder muscle. We can have a lazy bladder with excessive filling of the bladder and getting high pressure because of that. Or we can have a problem on compliance, which will lead to small bladder capacity and normal bladder capacity in the children if age plus one multiplied by 30. During the emptying phase, we can have an underactive bladder or a completely lazy bladder who is not contracting at all, but we can also have a functional obstacle, which is the pelvic floor muscle contraction, and that's a very important part of our work as a physiotherapist, is to learn them how to relax it. What are the symptoms of those pathologies? Well, overactive bladder will lead to urgency with a sudden feeling of the need to void. Parents will describe this as the child you have to park the car from the moment he feels it or as if the child is always waiting the last minute. You can assist with leakages, incontinence if bladder pressure exceeds urethral closure and this is, can be because of overactive bladder or excessive filling, and you can see an incomplete emptying leading to recurrent urinary tract infections. Do we see this often in children? Well, sometimes a little spot in about 8% of 10 to 14 years old children, but still 3% of them are wetting their pants every day or several times a week, and not just a little bit. They are soaking wet or really wet spotting is only for half of them. Those children are at very high risk to develop urinary tract infections, as you can see in this graph. This is the same for children suffering from fecal incontinence. How are you going to make the diagnosis? Well, this can be made through a standardized questionnaires to make an anamnesis and you should ask parents to fill in calendars so you can exactly see what's going on and what's going on. And those calendars, you find quite a lot of models from them, for them on internet. Now, what are we going to do to treat those dysfunctions? We are going to give urotherapy. Urotherapy is a very important part of treating those children. During this therapy, you are going to give explications, advice, you are going to train bladder sensation if necessary, and you can use alarms. Is urotherapy helping? Yes, in more than 80% of functional urinary uh, lower urinary tract infections, urotherapy is working. Now, if you explain to children, make sure that the child is understanding what you're telling him. Use drawings and adapt the drawings to the child's age. So, for example, you can use this one for children between age between 5 and 10 years. You start explaining them that we have cleaning teams in our body, which are the kidneys, and that if you talk about cleaning teams, well, you need water, and once the water is dirty, you need to throw it away. And dirty water in our body is urine. Once the bladder is filling, during the filling of the bladder, the bladder has to inform your brain. 
about. He has to fall. If he is falling, well, you have to listen what he is going to tell you. So here already we have two uh, possible problems. One is that the phone is on silent and you don't hear it. And the other one is that you are not listening to what the bladder, to what the bladder is telling you. Once uh, the brain has got the information, he has to tell the bladder what to do. And there is a small problem. The guys around the bladder don't speak our language. And as we don't speak their language, we have a communication problem. So we need somebody to explain to them what we want them to do. And that's our policeman. In reality, that's our pelvic floor. Those policemen has and when he opens it, it means to those guys that they may go out and they may go to play. On the other hand, he has a red sign, which means stop, you don't move, you wait until I have time to go to the toilet. But it is the same thing as if your mistress is not wanting you to go to play. What's going on then? You get angry and that's the same thing for your bladder. All those little guys are getting angry because they want to go to play. And you can try very hard to withhold them, but you're not strong enough. There are so many of them and you are just alone. So we will have to change things and make them learn what you really want to do. And that's where the advice is coming in. Advice on how to drink, when and how to avoid on the position on the toilet. Therapeutical calendars are a really very nice support for the children and the parents and are the way you are able to control what has been done. So in drinking, adapt it to the child and the parents, of course. You're going, we know where we want to go in the ideal way, but very often this is not possible within three, four weeks. So explain to the child how much to drink, when to drink, and what to drink. Also, you're going to explain to the child that the only way to milk, to uh, make this angry man listen to you is telling them that they have to empty the bladder and they will turn in again into night gas. This is what we call time and voiding, and we ask the children to go to the toilet every two hours in order to avoid contractions of the bladder. So don't wait the need to go to void. Just go every two hours. Your role will be to coach the child and the parents. It sounds very easy. Well, believe me, it's not that easy. You have to motivate them, to encourage them, and be careful to divine, define realistic objectives. Eventually, you can use an alarm watch, which is vibrating or ringing every two hours to remind the child the need to go into the toilet. Just some examples of what you can use as a and then, again, according to the age of the child, sometimes they like very much making their own, own calendar on the computer. Next, you have to explain is the position on the toilet. First of all, in order to have a good relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles, you need a stable position on the toilet. If the bottom of the child 
and the toilets are not adapted one to another, it will be very difficult to relax the pelvic floor and the contractions of the pelvic floor will trigger again the sequel reflex leading to incomplete emptying. On the other hand, you really need to explain to the child that he is not allowed to push, that normally it's the bladder who is working. If he is pushing, you will have an increase on intra-abdominal pressure, which again will trigger the pelvic floor muscle contraction, which will trigger in turn the sequel reflex. To train sensation, it is very easy. You have a direct feedback. You remember I told you that they are not picking up the signal coming from the bladder. So ask them when they go to pee to estimate the quantity of the mixture. Is it small, big? And then fine tuning until you reach a very small, small, normal, big and very big quantity. So if you put on those rules, you have to respect some lines. First of all, you have to establish realistic objectives for the child and the family with them. Don't do this alone and have a look what's possible for those families. If you do the evaluation, it must be done in function of respect of the rules, not in being dry or wet, especially not in the beginning. If the child respected to go every two hours to the toilet and has been drinking in a correct way, has relaxed on the toilet, has not been pushing, that's a good point. Even when he has been spotting this several times a day. Have a discussion with the child and the family on the difficulties to respect the rules and then tap them again when you understand what's not working. You need regular control. It's a little bit depending on each family how often you do this. Generally it's about once a month because things are not moving that quickly. And you need to motivate the child and the family. If this all is not working you can use alarms. Alarms will draw attention to the bladder behavior for the child and lure them to anticipate the feeling of this bladder behavior. Alarms can learn them how to react to wetting and even feel the wetting. Some children will tell you that they don't even feel when they are wetted. And of course, the ultimate objective of this is avoid wetting. Wetting alarm systems exist in a for diurnal incontinence and for nocturnal incontinence. You just want to try your attention, to draw your attention into the use of wetting alarms during the night. Make sure the child has almost achieved normal bladder capacity. Make sure there is a normal urine production for the night, which should be about one third of the day volume. Make sure that during the day, sensation in the bladder is correct and responded with an adequate reaction. And be aware of the fact that it needs an intensive conditional training, especially at the beginning, during the first 14 days. So don't start this uh, just before the people going on holiday. So the conclusion of my talk is that urotherapy is a combination of sensory cognitive motor training with automatization as a goal and is really an important part of uh, treating those dysfunctional lower urinary tract dysfunction and uh, should help. Good morning, everybody. Wow, that was hard, wasn't it? It's always <laughs> difficult to um, 
not be able to interact with somebody. So what I would like to do now is put the urological context to what we've heard, because we use pelvic floor a lot, but actually that isn't the issue in most of the children. And you know, as physios in our undergraduate and to some degree our postgraduate training, we don't learn much about urology and particularly the upper tracks. And I think for a very long time, um, pediatric urologists were rightly concerned that physios um, taking hold of a child would actually not make the condition better, but would jeopardize their health. And I think I need you to walk away knowing that we can do harm if we don't have the basic information. I'll talk a little bit um, about the bladder storage and voiding, although we've seen that in uh, the previous presentations and just a, a minute or two about intervention. You've seen a few uh, illustrations of the anatomy of the bladder. I just uh, put it, this uh, cross section in for you to see that the, the bladder wall, and that's the bladder is called the detrusor muscle. The bladder wall is muscular. It's got layers of muscle and the lining of the bladder is very like the lining inside your lips, the mucosa. It's called the endothelium. And in the last few years, we've, we've um, acknowledged that it's an organ in its own right, the lining of the bladder. When uh, the bladder generates more pressure than it would ordinarily be expected to do, you get hypertrophy of the smooth muscle of the bladder. And when you look in it, the diagram in the corner is showing you what you would see on cystoscopy, and you see a reorganization of the fibers. They're going in every direction. They look really quite tortured. You can see that uh, in a bladder. We obviously don't do that, but there's a physical change that underlies um, what's going on. And in lots of ways, uh, this drives the other symptoms. You've seen a picture of the pelvic floor. I just want to point out to you that it's a, it's a slim muscle. It doesn't have that much bulk if you would compare it to the big muscles of um, our legs and arms. And therefore, you're dealing with a sensation that's small and um, not well perceived if you've got a hypersensitivity disorder. Let's just remember the bladder filling mechanisms that the detrusor muscle that I showed you maintains low pressure. It's able to do that because it's elastic and you should always have a low pressure in your bladder as it fills. We get the idea that the bladder is filling because of distension um, on the stretch receptors. And this is why if we've got children who aren't having uh, good perception and good organization or are having heightened perception, it's maybe not something unusual about the bladder, it's about the efferent afferent systems as well. So we've talked a little bit about when you should start to feel this. And we have our person on the toilet, not very ideal as you can see. So we've seen a little bit today about what happens when you void. This is presumably when you decide you want to void. The pelvic floor relaxes and the sphincter uh, for the urethra relaxes and the whole outlet distends. Nothing will happen unless the detrusor contracts or you use lots of intra-abdominal pressure to override and to push the urine out. After the uh, detrusor has finished contracting, the whole outlet collapses and the urethral sphincter and the pelvic floor return to their resting pressure of being contracted. So that's how it should work. For those of you not familiar with uh, this, this is a urodynamic trace. So the blue line is the pressure that you read inside the bladder. There's a, a pressure transducer that goes in with the catheter um, because these tests are run by filling the bladder through a catheter. And it's got a, a dye that we can see um, on imaging at the same time. So you see this light blue line goes up and up and up. This says that the pressure in the bladder is rising. Um, we don't know whether that's because of intra-abdominal pressure. So the purple line is the subtracted pressure of what's going on in the abdomen. So the purple line, the PDET, pressure detrusor, is what we look at if we have a urodynamic trace. And what we see is when that pressure drops, that's immediately when the red flow rate voids. This is perfect. Um, we get a rise in pressure, and the pressure stops as soon as the flow starts. That's what we like to see, but we don't often see. You've, told, you've um, seen how we have to have an interplay of the nervous systems to void. It's an amazingly 
a coordinated activity requires a lot of motor planning and finesse to be able to uh, integrate your sympathetic system, your parasympathetic system, and your somatic system. Now, I need to point out, if you're treating adults um, for urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, voiding dysfunction, that your children are not the same. I think that in adults, uh, the symptoms develop in a, in a probably a completely different way. So let's be very clear what we have no business treating. And these are the organic causes of urinary incontinence in children. These are uh, structures that open into areas of the anatomy that they shouldn't be opening into, ectopic structures. And you can see here um, a ureter coming down from a kidney and opening into the urethra. The symptom for this would just be continuous leaking, but they don't all open into the same odd spots. A neurogenic bladder, which is not getting the, the right efferent afferent balance of information. And we usually find that they're very small, thick bladders, uh, overly active, high pressure systems. Epispadius and hyperspadius, you can see illustrated there, is where the urethra in the male opens onto uh, some part of the penis that isn't uh, the meatus. That's always fixed up in childhood, but scar tissue develops, you know, between seven and nine years of age, for example, and we see some really abnormal things. That would be something like a stricture. Diverticulums are when you've got outpouching somewhere in the urinary tract and you store extra urine there, so even though the person's finished voiding, they've still got some urine on board that they can leak out if they change posture or something else. Now, of course, any urine that's retained in a warm, dark, wet place is going to be a good host for uh, incubating infections. And we've got all the things that happen um, with congenital abnormalities. Really important to know about these organic causes and to understand them. What I haven't talked much about uh, there is the psychoureteric reflux, and I'll, I might come back to that if we have time. Let's move on to understand the storage disorders. Um, these are not related to organic causes or um, anatomical malformations, and they're not related to you know, organic uh, neurogenic changes. So commonly we can see these in our children. Overactive bladder, this is like you would know about in adults. The uh, symptoms of this are very much in parallel. You go to the toilet a lot and you have urgency. In the case of children, urgency gives itself away because they posture, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, sometimes this extra pressure inside the bladder, um, when it should be relaxed during filling, is accompanied by something odd in the way the urine is passed when they void. So that's called dysfunctional voiding. Now, be aware that in the older literature, dysfunctional voiding was a term used for everything related to a bladder issue in children. But actually, it's just about the emptying phase. Now, there can be some sensory causes, as I alluded to. If you have um, a heightened sensitivity from your urethelium or you have a lack of sensitivity uh, from your bladder filling, this could change your storage. And then there's stress incontinence, which we don't see often in children, but it's uh, quite prevalent in adults. And there's giggle incontinence. So let's think about the symptoms of the overactive bladder. As I said, it gives itself away very often with this posturing. So children are finding a way to give themselves extra perineal pressure to counter the um, squeeze pressure generated by the hypertrophied, unstable detrusor muscle. So you very often see them uh, squatting down like this, or you might even see there's a thing called the curtsy sign, where they're, um, you know, like a deep curtsy, but it's a way to use adduction to increase perineal pressure. And I had a child that I will never forget who came in to the clinic and said, ah, yeah, I, I have to come here because all my friends think I like ants. So every playtime and lunchtime when I'm squatting down, I have to pretend I'm looking at the ants. And that's classic. 
So these children, uh, I like to describe it to their mothers as they're having a labor contraction. You know, when you're in labor and the contraction starts and there's nothing you can do about it till the contraction finishes. That's how these contractions feel to the children when they have uh, um, an unstable contraction. And they will leak if they don't find some way to get uh, extra closure pressure on the perineum, which is why they posture or they hold with their hands. The signs of this, we can see if we get them to pass their urine over a flow meter, we'll see that they have very strong force of the urine as they expel it, and we might describe that curve as looking like a tower. They don't usually have any issues with complete emptying. Usually they can let all the urine out unless they have an element of dysfunctional voiding. And these children with an overactive bladder will probably void quite often. So they're the kids that you'll say, do you, do you go out of class when everyone else is doing their work? Do you have to go to the toilet? Oh, yes. Or can you sit through a whole movie? No. <laughs> can you wait till the ad breaks? No. And then I mentioned the urethelium. I've just put these uh, diagrams up to remind you that changes to the urethelium persist after a urinary tract infection has been treated. You get uh, this post infection infection inflammation and children very often have recurrent urinary tract infections therefore the inflammation becomes chronic and that changes the sensation and reduces their ability to comfortably store urine. So the urethelium becomes quite inhospitable and then depending on what's in your urine it can make it even worse. And this changes the balance of afferent, efferent activity and you get more contractions in the overlying detrusor muscle than you might without this inflammatory change. And then we have some disorders of storage where the child hardly ever goes to the toilet. And it's had some awful names in the past, names that are not very easy to understand. But if you think of it as infrequent voiding, then this might come up on the bladder diary. The voids will only be two or three in the whole 24 hour period. So what does this actually mean? It means that the bladder is overly distended, storing very large amounts of urine, it means that the length tension curve that you can develop with this smooth muscle is, is not going to be enough to empty it. Uh, and they'll have to find ways to get the urine out. So they might strain with their abdomen, um, they might bow salva. If we get these children to pass their urine over a flow meter, we'll see that it takes a long time, so it's a very long curve and it doesn't have much power behind it. If we did a urodynamic study on these children, we would see that the detrusor doesn't have much contractility and the sarcomeres are maybe not even overlapping to be able to generate this. And classically, they can't empty properly. As I said, what does this mean? This means that you can um, be generating and incubating infections. I mentioned before that stress incontinence is not common in children. Stress incontinence, for those of you that aren't aware, is that when you increase your intra-abdominal pressure, you squirt urine. And classically in the adult population, um, they're coughing, they're sneezing. In men, this can happen after um, they've had prostate surgery. In our young girls, though, we might see it if they've had a chronic disorder uh, where they've had to do a lot of generation of intra-abdominal pressure, like you can say, see here, the, the CF girls who have to clear and people who have uh, hay fever, and our children who are constipated and have strained, and our road runners. And if we're looking at poor development of the pelvic floor and an imperforate anus is an example of this, where they've had to have surgery very early on to correct the anatomy, then the fibers in the pelvic floor muscle um, um, will be abnormal and won't support closure pressure. And then we have a very interesting condition called giggle incontinence. It's got some Latin names as well. And basically the children come in and this persists right into adulthood. And when I laugh, I wet myself. I've got a patient at the moment who's doing her, her final high school exams. And this is a real problem for her when she goes to parties, etc. And the research is, not there, we just don't understand it. We think that it's something uh, in the sort of the narcolepsy family, something about um, 
inappropriate inhibition from the higher centres, but we are really in the dark here. So somebody needs to study this. Let's talk about what happens when the, you, you want to let the urine come out. Sometimes the meatus in the boy is fused and the lumen is not as big as it should be, which is a form of obstruction. And it backs right up so that the, the truser tries to generate higher and higher pressures. Uh, it doesn't work because of the small lumen and you get this low flow rate. A bit like what you might see with um, prostatic hypertrophy later, but the stream doesn't deflect in that situation like it does in our boys with meatal stenosis. And a classic thing that you'll probably see twice in your lifetime in girls is reflux into the vagina. So you empty the urethra, bladder generates pressure, urine goes into the urethra, urine comes out of the urethra and funnels itself into the vagina. And you, you get a hint of this because there, there's often fusion of the labia, so it acts like a funnel. And they're often sitting on the toilet with a posterior pelvic tilt, or they've got sizable thighs and they don't actually open, so the labia don't open and the urine is able to funnel. And I've just put a little diagram here because I think this helps you to understand. This is the normal pelvic position. There's no way that the urine is going to come into the urethra, into the vagina is there. But you turn the pelvis posteriorly, and it's quite possible. You turn it anteriorly on the toilet, and you get the child to open their legs and sit with an anterior pelvic posture and watch the flow of urine come out and into the toilet. And if that's the issue, they're not going to be wet anymore. I've alluded to how if you increase the resistance of the whole outlet system, so the urethra, then you have to generate a lot more pressure to get the urine out. So think about what might cause that increased resistance. So right at the neck of the bladder, the fibers of the detrusor uh, come down into the top part of the urethra, so that's the neck of the bladder area. There's some research suggesting that the neck of the bladder doesn't always open in a timely fashion like it should. Or it could be further down the urethra, the actual sphincter of the urethra itself has some skeletal fibers in it. And that means that disorders of motor planning and motor programming, etc., can change the timing of the relaxation of those fibers. Or below that, we've seen the pelvic floor muscle. And I like to describe to the children that the pelvic floor has a buttonhole in it to let the urethra through. And sometimes it's a tight buttonhole. And sometimes we can learn how to make that buttonhole less tight. And we've heard from our first speaker how this changes your programming in, in, your, um, in your neural pathways about how to void. So what are the symptoms of children who void in this dysfunctional fashion? Well, they overlap a little bit, so it's quite subtle. They have the urgency that we've seen. They might posture, they might uh, have to seem to go to the toilet quite often, or they might rarely go. There's two ends of the spectrum. If they're on the rarely go end, they might be accompanied by poor bladder emptying. You might also see that they have to raise their intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, they're likely to be incontinent if they're on the other end of the spectrum. And you might see the, the bedfellows of this, that is uh, wetting the bed at night time, enuresis, getting recurring infections and being constipated. Now, our last speaker is going to talk about the crosstalk that goes on at the spinal level between the bladder and the bowel. They definitely talk to each other in dysfunction. One um, pertains to dysfunction in the other. So you've got to look out for constipation. There are some organic causes of uh, avoiding dysfunction, which you have to be absolutely aware of. Anything that uh, has decreased the lumen of the urethra, like a stricture or an obstructive membrane. These obstructive membranes are usually congenital, but they can be missed until the early teenage years and anything going on uh, in the neurological system. Why do children develop dysfunctional voiding? This is interesting. And it was alluded to in the uh, video that we just saw. So the toilet training years can be quite important 
Uh, if you have dysuria, so pain when you're passing your urine, you very quickly learn to change how you pass your urine. You change your motor programming. So you don't relax the voluntary structures as, as you would, or you turn them on and off, on and off, on and off during your void just to control how much discomfort you're going to feel. And once you've learned to do that, then that's how you do it, even if you don't, no longer have the dysuria. The same thing can happen if you even have one episode of painful constipation. You can change the way you use this whole hammock functionally. Now, you can also do this because you've got high pressure in your detrusor. High pressure systems, we call them, are extremely dangerous because they can allow the urine to push back up through what should be uh, the one-way valve mechanisms and the pressure can ascend to the higher tract, the kidneys, and we can get t kidney damage. So one of the ways to do that is to break with the pelvic floor because that turns off the bladder contraction. So this is something you would know if you treated adults with continence issues, that five or six fast twitch contractions of the pelvic floor feeds through this loop to the dome of the bladder and it relaxes. And so kids have learned without knowing it that you can do that. You can activate the pelvic floor to reduce this pressure and that's a safety mechanism um, for these upper tract pressures. Okay, we will just pass by this. So there's some real issues if we don't identify and manage voiding dysfunction. Um, our children develop urological uh, complications that have long-term effects, and we need to be very sure that we know how to identify each of these uh, potential problems. Some of our children will activate their sphincter during voiding to obstruct their flow. Others will have this underactive bladder that I've mentioned, and others will have a primary bladder neck. But the key with the primary bladder neck, I think, is that they will admit to hesitancy. That means I want to pee, I get there, I try to pee, Nothing comes out, and after a while it starts. That's a bit of a red flag for, for potentially uh, having bladder neck dysfunction. So just bladder overactivity isn't dysfunctional voiding. I've, seen, I've uh, told you about that. And here I'm just reminding you that there's two ends to the spectrum, the small, thick-walled bladder that is very tetchy, and the large, laid-out, super relaxed, but actually fairly dysfunctional um, detrusor. So when we want to help these children, we've got to figure out what the appropriate goal is. And it's always to empty the bladder properly. That's why we're different to adults. Uh, in adults, we're generally trying to keep everything in the bladder, but in children, we want to make sure that the bladder empties normally because this will then change a high pressure system into a more normal pressure system. So the mechanics of how you void become very important. And I'm sure that uh, you will, it will become clear in the next presentation that, that we don't teach our children how to have tight, high, strong pelvic floors. We teach them what they feel like and how to turn them off so that you can empty. You want to be sure, especially if you're working um, by yourself or in a, a private practice without any um, pediatricians or pediatric urologists, that you have not missed something. And so we want to screen for osmoles, we want to know what's in the bladder diary, we want to have a flow trace if possible, and we want to know if the bladder completely emptied during that void. It will help you perhaps to use either of these uh, two symptom scores that are written here, and to understand if there's any upper tract changes in your child, including uh, scarring of the kidneys. And if you treat a child for three months or so and nothing changes, then you move them on because they're going to need a further investigation, probably a urodynamic investigation, to know exactly what's happening with the pressures, with the filling and with the emptying. Just to uh, agree with the previous presentation, you've got to explain this to the children, but actually the parents probably are, are just as in the dark as the children about this mechanism and what goes on. So you're, you're actually educating everybody when you're using your little picture and your diagram and you're explaining about Mr. Wee and how he knocks and what he does. And I mentioned that we're very much looking at pelvic floor awareness. If we do 
address the pelvic floor and definitely not um, a strengthening program for most people. It doesn't sit in uh, urotherapy or physiotherapy, whichever you want to call it, doesn't sit in isolation. We will quite likely have to use some uh, pharmacotherapy, so some antimuscarinics or the newer generation of drugs that will reduce the pressures generated uh, by the detrusor in the early filling phase. I'm a great fan of neuromodulation where we use uh, low frequency current to send it into the spine to make up for the lack of descending inhibitory information and we, through neuroplasticity we can rebalance the system. Sometimes we have to use intermittent catheterization in special cases. And you're looking, you're always looking. You need outcome measures to know whether uh, your treatment has been effective. You're looking to see the symptoms uh, resolve, so less incontinence issues, less severity of issues, uh, less urgency, longer intervals between urinary tract infections, um, and resolution of fecal soiling. And it's not very often that we can uh, redo all the initial investigations, but if we can, we might see that the bladder wall thickness reduces and the grade of reflux goes down, the rectal diameter reduces, etc. And I just leave you with this picture of a bush toilet in Australia. This is actually uh, on my husband's family farm. And when the hole fills up, you just move the house, put it over the top of another hole. And you don't put a door on it, and the redback spiders live in it. And if I had grown up there, I'm sure I would have dysfunctional voiding. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hello. I'm going to try to finish this off here quickly for you. Um, I want to start by thanking everybody for being here because this is a um, very passionate topic for me. Um, and there are so many children out there that need your help a lot of children that need your help. I'll start with a short story. Uh, my pediatrician called me about 15 or so years ago and told me that her daughter-in-law took the organs out of a, she's a pediatric anesthesiologist, her daughter-in-law took the organs out of an 11-year-old boy who hung himself because he had fecal incontinence, because he was teased by his siblings and friends. And it's devastating what happens to children. We haven't really touched on the psychological side effects, so I won't go into too much detail but I want you to know that these children really do suffer when they have bowel and bladder issues. So thank you for being here to help them. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about bowel and bladder dysfunction in general. So the anal rectal and lower urinary tract function are interrelated. Um, the, and lower urinary tract uh, symptoms occur in approximately 30 to 50% of children, and that's been reported by gastroenterologists as well as pediatric urologists. The symptoms in relationship to quality of life, the symptoms of constipation and bladder issues have significant impact on the quality of life affecting the physical and emotional well-being of the child and the family. And if you get a combination of enuresis or bedwetting and daytime incontinence with fecal incontinence, they're more affected by psychological comorbidities than children with isolated disorders. So we've talked a lot about the issues about bladder dysfunction and what those symptoms are, so I'm gonna move past that, but let's talk about symptoms of constipation. Um, a child could be constipated if they have less than three bowel movements per week. The consistency of their stool is hard. There's a large caliper stool or size of the diameter of the stool. If they have pain or straining with defecation, any history of withholding behaviors, and if they've had any fecal incontinence or soiling. So when we look at this, this whole, the functional constipation curvature, about 95% of constipation is functional constipation. So we know as stool enters the large intestine, the large intestine starts to absorb water. Now when we, the stool sits in the large intestine over prolonged periods of time, more and more water gets absorbed, the stool then becomes harder, then the stool is retained, um, and it, the rectum becomes distended. There's overflow fecal incontinence, what happens, we call it bypass diarrhea, where the liquid stool comes past the imp impacted part of the, uh, of the stool that's been sitting, and then it comes to the um, outside, it hits the internal anal sphincter, like it's diarrhea, then that sphincter can't maintain, and then the children have incontinent episodes. Um, then you get loss of rectal sensation, and a loss of urge to defecate, and then the whole cycle continues, and continues, and continues. 
When that keeps going on, the children can experience what we call megarectum. There's, again, reduced rectal sensation. There's a higher compliance um, in the rectum. The larger stool volumes um, are, requ are required to, requ to, to stimulate a uh, response for an urge. The rectum becomes dilated, and the re rectum then becomes a storage organ versus a sensory organ. Some common medications that you'll see in constipation could be ADHD medications and anticholinergic medications. When it comes to anticholinergic medications, the, the risk here is a lot of bladder issues are treated with anticholinergics and they can cause constipation. So it's important that the practitioner understand that and be aware, very aware that that can happen. Narcotics can cause constipation and antacids. The Rome 4 criteria for uh, disorders of the gut and brain interaction describe defecatory system, symptoms have to occur for at least three months, at least once a week. And they can be associated with a change in frequency or, of the stool and the appearance, a change in the appearance of the stool. So Movacol, which is the Australian version of uh, Miralax in the United States, um, uses this, um, the poo chart. And, and we, unfortunately, we describe poop in, in terms of um, food a lot, which is a little unfortunate. But rabbit droppings is a very severely constipated child. Um, a bunch of grapes, uh, corn on the cob. Um, I like to use the term a ripe banana for type number four. Um, mushy blobs or chicken nuggets for five and then porridge or gravy. Uh, what I wanna say about constipation I think is a really strong take home message for you is that a child gonna have a bowel movement every day that's type four and still be constipated. Okay, so just because they're going every day does not necessarily mean that they're not constipated when their other symptoms are not resolving. We need to look further. And when we do look further, we look at um, a KUB. A KUB stands for kidney urinary bladder or an abdominal plain film x-ray. And you can see on your slide on the left, um, that's a normal KUB. But if you notice over here in the pelvis, this is a, a child that has, is full. There's a lot of stool sitting up here and up here. And that child has constipation. So some of the risk factors for constipation include delayed seeking health care for defecatory disorders. Um, I don't know about those of you that have children, but when you stop wiping their bottoms, you stop knowing when they poop. And that's normal. And the kids don't know of what's normal for them to poop anymore, and so they just, they just carry on that way. Um, so we're not, we're not asking. Um, parents aren't seeking, and then, and then the pediatricians may not be asking. A low socioeconomic status. Uh, inadequate toilet facilities, they might be unclean or unhygienic, and that leads to withholding. A lot of children and adults don't like to um, empty their bowel in a public restroom, so they'll hold, and if that continues, it becomes a problem. When that happens, and they might have a large diameter stool, and there's pain when they have a bowel movement. When a child has pain with a bowel movement, then they withhold even further because they're afraid it's gonna hurt the second time. And I will tell you that it can take one episode of a painful bowel movement for a child to start withholding and not stop. Um, a change in routine, um, social situation or illness. Um, some children can have a bacterial infection and it causes itching and burning around the rectum. If that occurs, then those children will also um, withhold. And availability, again, of toilets and dislikes of toilets. Some symptoms of stool retention are abdominal pain, offensive body odor, Stools that plug the toilet, we call them tin can poopers. The children, we have, I have seven-year-olds that can have a, a bowel size this large in diameter. And they plug the toilet. A lack of appetite, um, urinary incontinence or urinary frequency, bypass diarrhea that I just mentioned, um, and chronic withholding can lead to abnormal motility of the bowel sensation as well as sphincter function. Other related factors looking at um, low fiber diet. You know, we have a very, in America, we call it the SAD diet. It's, it's very sad, the standard American diet. We kids, the kids are not eating healthy. Um, decreased physical activity, highly densely populated community, low parental education level is a risk factor, developmental delay, excessive weight, and behavioral problems such as ADHD, autistic spectrum disorders, and anxiety and depressive symptoms. And patient factors as, as uh, We've already heard from Karina that poor trunk control and poor sitting posture has been shown to correlate with slow transit constipation, so that always needs to be assessed in the child. Here's a little guy on a squatty potty with a next step toilet seat 
And this is a, just a nice example of how we should support our kids on our toilet so we can get a better proper positioning for defecation for the anal rectal angle. So again, initial causes that are common for school, stool retention is no availability of a toilet. They're on a long car ride, um, you're taking a trip, uh, you're shopping, or it's, um, you don't want to share a, a toilet facility. An unpleasant, as uh, Wendy's bush toilet might be um, a stool retention cause. Um, automatic flush toilets, for those of you that work with sensory integration disorders um, with children, they, the automatic flush toilets really scare them. You can try putting a sticky note over the automatic flusher, that can help. Um, embarrassment, some schools actually don't have doors on their stalls in the bathrooms. Um, and so the kids are embarrassed or if they have to have a bowel movement during the school day, they, they, class mites might tease them and they're humiliated so they withhold and they don't go again at school. Inactivity or children that have been hospitalized and have long-term bed rest. Um, again, not enough fluid and fiber, fruit and vegetables. And if they've had a history of a large stool in the past, an anal fissure or pain or infection, and there was irritation around the rectum and the anus, um, around the anus specifically, then they may have also some withholding patterns. So the pathophysiology, there's three theories. Um, not all of them are completely understood. And I think there's a combination of things here. But in the center, we have bowel and bladder dysfunction. And then there's pressure on the posterior bladder wall from constipation and stool. Um, it can irritate the trigone, it causes mechanical pressure, causes pressure against the posterior vaginal wall, and then the bladder, urethra, neck, and, um, and um, can be obstructed. So that can cause the bladder issues with the bowel. A, secondary, a second theory is that there's a neurologic mechanism because they share one functional unit of, in, of, of neurologic input with shared reflexes from bowel, bladder, and proximal urethra. And thirdly, there's prolonged external anal sphincter contraction, and that causes inappropriate pelvic floor muscle contractions, urethral sphincter relaxation, and then you get bladder overactivity, which can lead to urinary incontinence, urinary tract infections, and vesicle ureterable reflux, which Wendy just alluded to, where there's urine that backs up the ureters into the kidneys. We also look at questionnaires, one written by our Wendy right here. Um, the pin Q, looking at quality of life uh, measures and emotional impact in children. The short screening instrument for psychological problems in aneuresis or bedwetters, and that looks at the psychological problems associated with lower urinary tract dysfunction and bowel and bladder dysfunction. And there's a dysfunctional avoiding survey. And here's an example of a dysfunctional avoiding survey. It's quick and easy, asks some questions about voiding and bowel habits from both the parents and the um, the parents fill out, but of course the children as best they can. And I'm going to finish by just sharing one of my um, pictures. The children like to send little pictures and say, thanks. You know, it's a nice way to say it says, uh, dear, dear Miss Dawn, um, I wear my underwear all day long. <laughs> and so there's a, a huge population of children out there that we need to address. And I have a little soapbox I'd like to share with you. Um, and that is, I never use the word accident. Uh, by definition, the word accident means an unforeseen event, and a urinary or fecal incontinent episode is that. Um, however, how does it feel to any one of you in this room if I said, did you have an accident? Did you have an accident? Does that feel good to you? Um, and then you're naming the child as having something that's really a physiologic problem. So I like to call it a, a urinary or fecal leak and then I'll ask the child if their bladder had a leak or if their bowel had a leak. So psychologically, they don't take that on uh, themselves, that they, we can look at the physiology and understand the anatomy. As, as Wendy mentioned, education is so important for the families. Families come in and they don't understand and parents don't understand and they think the children are doing things on purpose. And it really is physiological, so we really need to educate our families so they understand the physiology of why a child is having urinary or bowel leakage and the combination and why constipation is so important. Their um, parents say, yeah, we've done the Miralax or the Movacol and we've tried this, but they're still having problems. It's critical that you follow through with the program and make sure that the child is having daily bowel movements. I once had a seven-year-old child who was having a type four bowel movement every day, no straining. It was not on my radar screen that this child was still constipated. Long history of constipation, however.
um, they did a KUB or x-ray on her and she had calcified stool in her transverse colon. So she was clearly not cleaned out. And so when you have a child that you're working with and things are not getting better, um, please look at the bowel as a source of the problem there so that they are, um, so that doesn't get neglected. And when they do a clean out, make sure that you follow the clean out with making sure they didn't stop taking the medicine. As soon as parents see the child has looser stool and if they have a leak, they stop all the medicine. And they stop using the, the Miralax or the Movicol or whatever they're using uh, for bowel movements and then the child backs up again very quickly. So I encourage you to make sure that they're consistent with that and they maintain an empty bowel throughout that process. So I think Wendy's gonna come back up, or not Wendy, I'm sorry, Karina's gonna come back up and and summarize for us, and then we can take some questions. So just to summarize our presentation, uh, really it is important to assess a child's bowel and bladder habits. Parents are frequently unaware of bowel habits once children come out of diapers, as, as Dawn said. Uh, constipation is prevalent and needs to be ruled out as a comorbidity for any bladder dysfunction and always assess postural and trunk control with bowel and bladder dysfunction. Screening is key with this. Problems that develop in childhood can often persist and worsen in adulthood. Uh, we have a lot of pediatricians that just say, oh, they'll grow out of it. And then these children then have problems that persist into adulthood. We should be reviewing both pediatric and pelvic floor physiotherapists should be looking at bowel and bladder dysfunction. And it's important to initiate this conversation early for lifelong pelvic health. Uh, so we would like to thank you uh, for listening to our presentation and we do have a couple of minutes for questions for the whole panel. So if you do have any questions, just come over to a microphone, I think, and um, ask them so that we can hear. Yes. Yeah, you might want to, since you're all the way in the back. <laughs> Hi there, thanks for that. That was, that was a stunning presentation. Uh, in the UK, about 9% of our four to five year olds are obese, and about 20% of our 10 to 11 year olds are obese. So that and sedentary lifestyle and poor sleep health with screen time, are those also factors that might lead to an increase in incidence? of childhood pelvic dysfunction? I would say all of us would say absolutely. Um, definitely, from, even from a bowel and bladder standpoint, um, you know, uh, from a motor control standpoint, if from an obesity standpoint, they're gonna have decreased postural control, decreased muscles. I don't know if you guys wanna say anything else about that as well. Well, I, inactivity typically leads to constipation. It would be like a child on bed rest, so they need activity. There was actually a case um, in the UK um, almost two years ago now of a 16-year-old child with special needs um, and she didn't have a bowel movement for three weeks and died of a cardiac arrest. So now we can say that constipation is fatal. <laughs> Maybe we'll get more press. <laughs> yes. Good morning and thank you for your presentation. Um, there's been a recent study done where they compared standard medical care in the Netherlands to standard medical care which included um, laxatives and physiotherapy where physiotherapy combined with standard medical care was more effective than standard medical care alone. My question is I've been struggling a lot with the doctors that are very scared of prescribing laxatives to children. And some of the books, like Dr. Steve Hodges' book, It's No Accident, they actually advocate aggressive laxatives, um, like enemas and that. Could you please tell me the standard laxative regime that you experience in your clinical practice, as I am struggling to even get doctors to prescribe Movicol for 30 days? Um, the program you're referring to is the MOPS program by Dr. Hodges, and um, it's, I'll, I'll tell you that it's never my first line of treatment for children. Um, I usually work through the entire urotherapy program before I would do that. 
Um, we do have some children that are completely backed up and they're, you know, his research has shown that it, the rectal diameter does decrease in 30 days. Um, and under the premise that the rectal pressure is causing bladder overactivity, um, that's the, the theory um, in his paper and his work. The tolerance for the enemas is variable. The research says that the tolerance is better for an enema than it is for um, Miralax for a clean out. Um, but that's not for 30 days. This protocol is 30 days um, of an enema every night with, with Miralax or Movicol and followed by an enema every other day for another 30 days. Um, I have some excellent results. I know a lot of the Mayo Clinic is using it pretty regularly, this protocol. Um, and I've had some children who just really have had enough. But I have to say, by the time the children get to me, they've, they've suffered from problems for five years and have had people working in their rectum for five years. And it's, it's too much. So you have to be sensitive to the child and the child's psychological state and where they are um, at, before I would start that protocol. Did I answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then, um, just to comment on that, one of the biggest barriers that I've experienced in treating children are the parents. Because according to parents, nobody's children are ever constipated. Never. Mm. If you could maybe elaborate on that. <laughs> so I will, one thing I will say about the parents is, I, I always say as a, as a pediatric therapist, you're never just treating one patient, you're treating the whole family. Um, and so really uh, what I do a lot is, is get it down in black and white. We've all talked about bladder diaries and, and making them really kind of pay attention to when their children are going uh, and, and really looking at, and as, as Dawn said, you can have a type four stool every day and still be constipated. So if all of these treatment methods haven't been working and they're still having issues, then perhaps it's time to, to look at some other tests and then to also um, do a lot of education. But treating, treating the whole family is unfortunate, an unfortunate side effect of treating pediatrics sometimes. For me, what I do in my practice is, um, and I know this is a little unconventional, uh, but there's always a parent-child conflict. And, um, and to avoid the parent-child conflict, the children have to text or call me every day, every single day. Um, they have a bladder boss chart they have to fill out every day. And, um, and the older kids text, the younger ones call, and they say, hello, Miss Dawn, this is Nicholas, and I've done everything on my chart today. Period. That's it. They're not allowed to say anything else. The parents are not allowed to get on the phone and talk to me either. And I, and I set those guidelines and boundaries when they first come in. The, um, the kids love doing it. The, the children, the primary age children, love to please their teachers, and you're a teacher. Um, and so they are very receptive to that. Um, if the children didn't get something done, then, I w then they tell me what they didn't get done and why. Now I'm the person that they can be upset about. And they, if they get upset with mom, mom just says to them, I'm sorry, honey, that was Miss Dawn that told you to do that. You can talk to her about it. And I encourage that, because they won't. I mean, <laughs> they won't give me a hard time, or they will give their parents a hard time. So I like to, to intervene there. It's, it's not much of my time. I, I speak to every child one time a week. So we have time for one more question. Carrie? <laughs> Uh, thank you, guys. This has been a, a great presentation and a, and a very important topic. Um, my question speaks a bit to the parents. Um, how do you um, explain to a parent when they have a child that may not go frequently during the day and the parent may see them as having massive bladder capacity um, but yet can't make it through the night? Well, I think first you don't assume that... Um, that one causes the other. And I think you have to explain to them that you can have, you can be enuretic and you can have uh, uh, an over-distended bladder during the day. They're, you have both of them like you might have asthma and um, headaches. They are things that coexist. One might feed into the other and which one will we address first? Which one's the most important to you? Traditionally, people will address the daytime issues and then move on to the nighttime issues, but you, you can see what you know, bothers them the most. All right, thank you, everybody. That is all the time we have, and thank you very much. <laughs>